Today I shall show you 200 hours of boat work satisfaction in just 20 minutes. That's 600 times real life speed. That's like one minute of video for every 10 hours of boat work we did. This is the final 200 hours of almost a year of work that we put into our dream catamaran. I just scheduled the massive lift that'll be dropping this boat back in the water in exactly 20 days. And for slightly more embarrassing reasons that I promise to explain in a bit, we cannot, under any circumstances, not finish on time. Boat projects always seem simple when they're still in your head, but they always find a way to spiral out of control. There were three projects that we needed to finish before we could splash the boat back in the water. Number one, reinstall the steering sheaves. Now that's what runs from this steering wheel right here all the way down and back to the rudder. Two, we had to fiberglass the rest of the bulkheads under the sun pad. And number three, we had to sand, prime, and paint the entire hulls. All right, that's kind of a big one. Alexi is a painter, so his job was prepping the hulls. Gracias, mi amigo. Gracias. Mary and I started working on the steering pulleys. I thought we only had eight bolts to mount and totally forgot we still had to glass the bottom of this boat. I had already ground away all the cracks, but this is what it looked like before. The bolts had pulled into the fiberglass. We used polyester resin here because you cannot use epoxy anywhere you plan to paint with gel coat because gel coat will not stick to epoxy. A random worker in the yard got so frustrated watching me move slow that he decided to take over. No, 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 sí, yo, sí. no bueno, huh? I noticed an unrelated drain cover that we totally forgot to fix. So Mary cut out some more fiberglass on the fly and we knocked that out too. I didn't say it was gonna be pretty. We're on a time crunch here. The plan was to knock everything out early and then just relax for a week. But in the off chance that we forgot something like fiberglassing a drain cover, we'd still have plenty of time to spare. Grinded it all down. We're about to put the big plate on there that Clint from Kima. Thanks so much, Clint. Appreciate it. Super thick. I will never have to worry about my steering sheaves pulling through the fiberglass ever again. Without this exact pattern and the extra crazy blob in the middle, this will not work. Your plate will just fall right down. See you or no? It's broken. Okay. <laughs> That's what I've been hearing all day today. Everything's broken. <laughs> Ooh, Carlito. <laughs> Carlos went upstairs to hold the nuts and I impact drove the bolts from below. And yes, it looks like I set my five-year-old loose with the cock gun, but at least water's not getting in those screws, that's for sure. As many of you guys know, we came all the way to Panama to find this guy, Colin, who has an awesome channel called Parlay Revival, and his first mate, Jamie. After buying our boat, we discovered it had badly broken bulkheads, which happens to be the most important structural part of the boat. And after literally searching the world, they were the only guys that were willing to help me fix them. <sighs> we had to replace this piece of wood right here. It was rotten. Thickened epoxy on the edges, mush it in place, and then make a smooth fillet on all sides. We're gonna glass all of this right here up into the wall, replace that wall right there. The forward section of this sun pad isn't exactly structural, so we only did two layers all the way around. I'm actually inside the sun pad locker, squatting Asian style like my brethren here. Up into the deck from here, glass this whole section, just a little bit of reinforcement. We're using Total Boat's high performance epoxy. Thank you for supporting our mission, Total Boat. There's a coupon in the description if you need some. Tap everything in all the way down to there. Reinforce that entire wall, that's the main bulkhead. And then we are done with all of our bulkheads. This is not the main bulkhead. I don't know why I said that. It's the aft bulkhead. We already fixed the main bulkhead and the mid bulkhead in previous videos. The easiest way to make a fillet is to take your bare gloved hand, grab a bunch of thickened epoxy, reach down in there and just whoop. Yes, it really does help if you make that sound effect while making a fillet. So we'll go back in there, clean up the edges. And then we glass baby glass. At least four layers because this part is structural. Are you guys gonna miss all this fiberglassing? Am I going to have to fiberglass random things periodically so you don't unsubscribe? Not only did the boys on Parlay show me how to fix the bulkheads, they pretty much taught me how to fix everything else on this boat. Like everything you'll see in this video and all my other videos for that matter. Parlay was parked next door, so I basically got to watch Colin refit his entire boat for the past year. And since I literally bought the same exact boat, everything he did applied directly to us. Like how to replace this line we completely forgot about. Do you see that black line at the end of the boom right there that goes all the way to the top, comes all the way down the mast and ends up right here. This line is the topping lift. We need to replace it with this topping lift that we got in the US. We've got enough line. 
New topping list, baby. I'm looking confused because I can't figure out why the boom was stuck. Turns out I forgot to loosen the lazy jack lines. They hold the sail bag up, which was holding the boom up. Once they were loose, we dropped the boom onto a fender and found a little surprise in the sail. Oh gosh, is there a bird living in here? It collected zip ties. Oh, things that look like branches, like wires. Poor little whatever you are. We're gonna destroy your home. Look, that bolt sheared off. The topping lift holds the boom up when you're not sailing. Some boats have this thing called a boom bang instead. After we destroyed the poor bird's home, I tried tying the old line to the new line five different ways with no success, so we pierced the ends and sewed them together. Then I wrapped the joint with twine and then with electrical tape. That should do it. It is connected. And then we pulled that up and over the top of the mast and down into it. We're two thirds of the way down the mast. It's trying to come out and that's where it's getting stuck. Yes, uh, we did it! And note to self, gotta replace this sucker here. Parlay's already done with their repairs and out there cruising deserted islands. Just did a tour of the island. But they're scheduled to be back for a few days and we have to finish this boat before they return. No exceptions. Everything has to be done and ready to splash before they come back. And I'll tell you exactly why in a minute. A six hour round trip to the city. Let's do this. With a pit stop at the Panama Canal and we had our replacement bolt for the boom. And it fit perfectly too after we cut it down. I also bought this right angle plier thingy to help hold the nuts while I screw in the Allen bolt from the top. How did this go bad? Oh no. I installed the pulleys upside down and then right side up, added some Loctite to be safe, found a spot for the leftover spacer, added a little brute force for good measure. Just hold it right there. <laughs> Mess with Mary a little bit. Okay, no. Um, and then pulled the boom back up and it worked. And that's how you change a topping with. Only took us a week and one day. Now what do we do with all these reefing lines? The Parlay boys were here for us from the beginning. Colin was the one that actually drove this boat to the boat lift and then coordinated how to haul it out without damaging it more. And then him and Jamie helped me straighten this boat, which took all day long in these massive pylons. And the crazy thing is they didn't even know me at the time. Mary's dream is to one day have real ACs on the boat. My dream is to have a water maker, both of which require access to seawater, so we decided to add another job to the list. Today is Through Hull Thursday, where we make holes in the boat. David is drilling the through hole from the inside, and I'm watching it from the outside. Hello? <laughs> they just drilled a hole in their hull. And it feels really counterintuitive, but eventually we'll need one for the water maker and two for the air conditioners. The trick is to drill halfway from the inside out and then the other half from the outside in because that last layer of glass that you drill is gonna tear and it did, see? You can see that one layer of glass that just tore. Eventually my boat became unlivable because of the repairs. So they gave me a cabin on their boat and they fed me and they welcomed me into the crew when I needed it the most. It's amazing how fast you can get overwhelmed when working on a boat and I was in way over my head. So apparently water maker through holes are different from air conditioner through holes and we already cut the holes so there was no turning back. But nothing that a quick trip to the city can't solve. <laughs> we made a pit stop to see some Panamanian fauna. We got to see a slug. And came home with a through hole with grates and also some plastic ones since we broke them when fiberglassing the sun pad. As you can see, I'm definitely getting better with the caulk gun. Apparently the grates prevent cavitation or bubbles so you can use the water maker while sailing. Oh, and we added some extra fiberglass to this area since there were three holes so close together. Yay, more fiberglassing. Stop filming me. <laughs> since Parlay was the only reason we had gotten this far, I thought it was only fair that they get to see this boat go back in the water. That's the main reason we have to make this deadline. And the second reason, it's a little bit more selfish. Practical, practical. Yeah, practical, practical. The port engine start button hasn't worked since forever. Most of the time, all you hear is this tick, 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 tick. I started to ask Colin about it, but before I could even finish, he was like, change relay RC18097A. So this is us changing relay RC18097A. The crazy thing is, he didn't even look at it to troubleshoot. He's like, uh, yeah, yeah, it's that one. Changed. Woo! That was it, 
dude, Colin's a genius, man. See or no? Yeah. That simple? Are you kidding me? Every time I had to start the motor, I had to jump down there, use a screwdriver to short the starter. To understand the second reason, we have to go back about a year. You see, I bought this boat without knowing how to sail. I wanted to learn on my own boat, you know? But we discovered the bulkheads were broken almost right away. So we had to sail it from St. Martin all the way down to Panama, still not knowing how to sail. We had these two captains that came along for the ride and got us there safe. Bye, James. Bye. We would have never made it without them. Colin left us a little parting gift that for the past two weeks, I had been too scared to use. But seeing as we were going back in the water in a week, I thought it was time I learned how to drive a dinghy. Rookie mistake, we forgot to plug the dinghy. Literally trying to sink this dinghy. I'd seen so many sailing channels do this on YouTube, so it came pretty naturally to be honest. Push right to go left, left to go right, and within a couple hours, I was taking Mary on our first dinghy ride all by ourselves. This is what we've been waiting for, for almost a year. It was just a dinghy, but we were finally on the water together. And then we got stuck on the reef for an hour. Then it was Mary's turn to learn. How to start a dinghy for the first time ever. I'll squeeze that little thing. Oh. Pull the choke out. Okay. Make sure this is in neutral. Pull that with your strong arm. There you go. Push the choke in. Do the same thing. Perfect. Now put it in go-go. Pull it towards you. She's crushing it. First time driving a dinghy. And then we went on our first dinghy mission to see our friends on Zephyr. We come bearing muriatic acid. <laughs> Later. I figured I could learn how to sail after we got to Panama. But we ended up pulling the boat out of the water right after we arrived. All to say, I still don't know how to sail. To be honest, I don't even know how to drive the boat, much less dock it. I steered the boat out in the open ocean, but there's not a lot of stuff to run into out there. So if we don't finish all this work while Parlay is still here, then we won't have anybody to help us splash the boat in the water or drive it to the slip, or take it for a sea trial so we could test all the repairs. And then I'll have to admit to the entire marina that I don't even know how to drive my own boat. This is me complaining about Mary making more work for us. She pointed out some tiny cracks in the gel coat at the base of this pole, and I check under the deck, and sure enough, the bolts had pulled into the deck. So surprise, more fiberglassing, thanks to Mary. That's our traveler above that roof. The post connects the traveler all the way to the deck. The fiberglass underneath was cracked. We glassed the heck out of it. Tapped up into the side, down into the bulkhead, to the right across the deck. Only took five hours. So I put triple washers, one huge fender washer, a smaller fender washer, and then a smaller regular washer. The gas theory of boat work and time. Gas expands to fit all of the space available to it. And boat work, it expands to fit all of the time available to it. For instance, these videos should take me about a week to edit. But every time I sit down at a computer, one of the kids screams or something else pulls me away. Even if nothing distracts me, I still need to go check my email every three minutes or respond to every YouTube comment. Before I know it, we're two weeks into the edit and I haven't even done anything yet. The Patreons know what I'm talking about. They're always on my case. David, would you David, go edit? David, 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 David. I love you guys. Here's the gas law of boat work in action. We had finally finished all the fiberglassing, but the boat was covered in fiberglass dust. So I hired Valerie. She's helping us clean all of the dust out of every single crack and crevice in the cabin. There was less than a week until we were splashing this boat and she promised to have it spotless before then. Check out the attention to detail and commitment to excellence as she cleans these drawers. I let her work her magic and Carlos and I went to fill some propane bottles. Thank you so much. And get some coffee. Valerie was on break when we got back, but then it turned into an early lunch, and then she just completely disappeared. So I had to take over. Raincoat, boots, hood, hose, and spray, baby. Instead of wiping, I figured I could spray down the whole boat in a couple of hours. Every surface needed to be cleaned, or when a gust blew through the cabin, it'd be like poof. The worst of it was behind the walls. You can see the runoff is all white. After an hour of spraying, I was still finding pockets of dust dammed up in the corners. I sprayed everything again, and when I finally thought it was done, I found this in all of the ceilings. So much dust. We didn't even grind in the ceilings. This is just dust slowly settling out of the air over time. I dragged two dehumidifiers down there and blasted them, and then moved on to the other three cabins. After a thorough investigation, I've discovered that the leading cause of the gas theory of work is the snowball effect of boat work, which states, 
Any boat project in progress will stay in progress until it causes the start of another boat project. In layman's terms, the act of fixing something causes something else to break, so now you have to fix the second thing before you can fix the first. Fixing the second thing, you'll inadvertently discover a third broken thing, so on and so forth. This cycle can and will continue indefinitely until you run out of time. The most ridiculous snowball effect started from a comment Colin made months ago about our rudder bearings. That's meant to stay still and the shaft is meant to spin on the bearing. On okay. anchor if it's a little bit rough and the waves are just kind of sloshing around, you might hear that all night. To fix the bearings, we had to remove the rudder, but the rudder post bracket was rusted so bad that we broke three bolts taking it apart. Then I broke the dowel pin that literally holds the rudder in the boat. This is the shaft that goes through the very top of the rudder post that holds the rudder post up. Miraculously, a furniture store in the city sold a cabinet handle with the exact same size. Once it goes through that rudder post, we need it to stay in there. We'll put some pins in there. We drilled the ends for the cotter pins and broke three bits and even made fire before getting through. Meanwhile, Mary got the welder to drill out the broken bolts, but the holes were so corroded, I had to hunt down a tap and recut the thread. Then she went down to the water and washed the brackets until they were so clean you can eat on it. That's gross. And then she painted them with a bunch of rust converter so they would never rust again. We finally started to drop the rudders, but realized the ground was in the way. The deck of the boat was about 10 feet up, but the bottom of the rudders were only a couple of feet above ground level. Alexi volunteered to lower the ground for us, and as I watched him dig, I realized I had climbed down that 10-foot ladder hundreds of times. And at five seconds a pop, this inefficiency needed to be rectified immediately. Fun project break. We took the pulleys and lines from the dinghy holder and rigged them across the solar arch, put a few sacks of dirt on one side and made a handle on the other. And then I risked my life for the most fun I've had in months. And then Mary went. And Alexi. And James from Zephyr. And even Colin and Jamie after they came back. Now I see why it takes him so long to fix this boat. Based on some rough calculations, this invention saved the team hundreds of seconds over the rest of the week. When we finally started to lower the rudders, I broke this shelf. Carlos cut it out, whipped up a new one, and fiberglassed it all in single-handedly. It's nice to have a Carlos. As the rudders came down, we noticed spider cracks on the posts. We had to seal in all these holes and tiny little cracks so the water doesn't penetrate and eventually mess up the fiberglass. Alexi sanded them down and resealed them with epoxy. And I ended up doing a bit of sealing and fiberglassing myself because the tops of the rudders had some cracks. cracks. There's the pressure of the water constantly pushing in, in, which means water can kind of seep in. We're filling in it with some matte fiberglass to kind of hold that resin and seal off the hole. And finally, we could start working on the rudder bearings. Mary and the kids were having some arts and crafts time. We got our next strip right here. Which we would use to shim the space between the bearings and the hull. This gap is what was causing that knocking sound. We siliconed them in place, slipped the bearings in. We knew they'd be the perfect thickness because that's how they fixed them on parlay. And reinstalled the rudders with no problems. Including the cut down cabinet handle. It fit perfectly. Did I mention that there's two rudders on this boat? Which means everything we've done, we had to do twice. Bueno, bueno. I never would have imagined that changing a rudder bearing, we didn't even change it, we just shimmed it, would be such a time suck. Although part of it was my fault because I didn't have to spend the morning building the get off the boat fast thingy. But at least we were finally done. And that is exactly how the snowball effect of boat work presents. It waits until you think that you're completely done and then reveals that you're not even halfway. We found a little crack in the bottom of the rudder and we're putting it up. Water started dripping out. Carlos already had it opened up. It was soft in some spots and damp in others. But when we really pushed on it, water came out. Mucho. So we had to keep on grinding. It still wasn't too bad at this point. It would just need a few layers of fiberglass, but more and more dark, wet spots appeared and then entire layers separated. So I told him to cut deep and that we'd rebuild it. Just cutting holes in our boat. By the time he was done, there was a huge chunk missing, but at least it was dry up here. Now we just have to dry it out, slap a bunch of filler in there, shape it correctly, fiberglass over it, fair it, prime it, anti-foul it. Hope we can do this in two days. It was looking pretty ugly, but once we got a few more layers of fiberglass on, there was hope. Carlos, 
He wrote his name on his shirt because he said, I'm getting old and I forgot. Some more layers and some more grinding sessions. And we had a pretty good rudder again. Final product. It's symmetrical. The profile looks good. It's fatter than it should be. It's good enough. Good enough is all we need right now. Even if you manage to conquer the snowball effect, you have to remember that the gas law of boat work and time is still in effect. And it's gonna do everything to take up all of your time. And we still had some time. Mary gets these weird hives from food sometimes. She had been itching ever since we ate these street empanadas on one of our trips to the city. But last night they started to spread. We ended up at a tiny hospital in the small village of Portobello. And of course, they spoke zero English. You think she needs my insurance card? Just kidding. But no sweat because I've been practicing my Spanish. Mi novia es María, solo una esposa. This wasn't the first time we had to go to the hospital for her hives. One time, her hives got so bad, her face started to swell so much you would not recognize her. <laughs> Imagine if she gained 500 pounds, how her face would look. That was from when she ate some Popeyes. What were you thinking? Don't throw Popeyes under the bus. It wasn't Popeyes, it was churches. I could tell these were prescriptions, but I couldn't really understand anything else. So I went to look for the pharmacy, and apparently she got a shot. What? I missed the shot? You gave me the shot. She didn't put a band-aid or anything on it. So I'm holding a, I guess, a piece of cotton or something. You pulled my pants back up because my pants were down. And she's like, okay, go. <laughs> and then we tried to pay, but they wouldn't take our money. Oh, we're good? Yeah. No. No. Oh, oh. I'm good. Why didn't they charge us the money? I'm very confused. Oh, this was free. Oh my God. <laughs> Whatever was in that shot made Mary more and more tired until she was completely unconscious for the rest of the day. But I was just glad her face didn't swell up like last time. I'm only showing you guys this for science because no matter how I describe it, there's no way you'd believe me. This is Mary in the hospital, circa 2012, after eating Church's chicken. This is her before we took her to the hospital. And this is how she normally looks. And please don't write anything in the comments about this because she reads all of them. The closer we got to Splash Day, the more surprise projects popped up, like fixing the propellers and changing the bilge pumps. But at this point, it didn't even phase us. We just powered through it until we had a day to go and one job left. Paint the hulls, which had actually been in progress this whole time. Alexi had sanded down both hulls by himself over the first week, and then we used Total Boat's epoxy barrier coat to seal the fiberglass. You've got to do a pre-mix before you add the hardener in. I had him put on five coats, which is double what you need, but we should never have to worry about doing primer again as long as we own this boat. You have about three hours in the Panama heat to get the next coat on before the previous one dries. It took about that long to do each coat, so Alexi was literally doing laps around the hulls for a couple of days there. Really, Alexi? You're just gonna leave halfway through this hull and ruin my time lapse? All we had left now was the anti-foul. We used their Spartan bottom paint, which is the heaviest liquid I've ever felt. It's got a bunch of copper in it, which prevents growth, but is also really heavy. He's my painter master, Alexi. He's crushing it with the anti-foul. The last couple of weeks were the hardest I have ever worked in my entire life. And I don't think I could have done it without the constant support and encouragement from our patrons. You guys have become part of our family, and we want a part of you to always be with us. And for those of you who have joined since, you'll be the first to go on the next time we haul out. As she finished up the last bit of painting, guess who sailed back into Linton Bay? Made it. My boys are back, our work is done, and nothing can stop us from splashing our boat tomorrow. Subscribe.